the book of James has been described as having three main themes. One, what it means to have God as our dad. Two, that it's pretty scary if we depend on just ourselves. Then things start to go wrong. And the whole thing sort of tells us what it means to grow and develop as a Christian. And in chapter 4, we're going to see all aspects of these three. We have to remember that James, as many of you know now, was writing to mainly Jewish people who would have these rules, these ways of living, locked in their minds. They would have learnt them at their mother's knee. They would have locked them in their hearts. They would carry them on their temples. They would be on above the door of their houses. And they would know what James was talking about as they read this chapter. I believe that just as any good parent sets guidelines for their family, God has told us via Moses and the prophets and shown us in the life of Jesus how we, his beloved children, should live out our lives in our love response to our Heavenly Father. And as Mary has said, God has generously provided his spirit to help us to do so as we work together to make the kingdom of God grow on earth. As the Lion Storyteller Bible puts it, God gave Moses ten important rules that showed his people how to live a good and happy life. I believe that God's rules are still important and he's still asking us to, as James puts it, be doers of the word and not hearers only. In his letter, James looks at the things we do as members of the human race, things that go against the guidelines that God has given us, and reminds us all both of the amazing things that God does for us through his grace and of our Christian responsibilities to God and to each other as members of his family and the Church of Christ. So let's look a bit closer at what we've just heard. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Can anybody think? I suppose none of you ever fight or quarrel. Is that, is that true? Sorry? Ah, yes. We all do, don't we? I remember I had a sister that was just 13 months younger than me, but she was taller than me. And I didn't like that very much because she was bigger than me. By the time we got to be three, she was the big sister and I was the little one, hence the stool. Um, but I remember that we used to argue like mad. I want that. Well, you can't have it, but it's mine. I had it first, but I want it now. Well, you'll have to wait. I want it now. Give it to me. I want, I want. It went on like that. And that's what Paul, that's what James is saying. Don't these fights and quarrels come from the desires, the wantings that we have that battle within us? And he wasn't just writing about arguments over toys or books or the TV remote. He was talking about serious quarrels and fights between grown men and women. You desire to do, but you desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet. That means wanting something that belongs to someone else. But you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. And that's what happens when wars start all over, over land or power or natural resources like oil or even water. 
and that leads to an awful lot of killing. It all starts, James writes, with desires I want. Mother Teresa has said, prayer is not asking. Prayer is putting oneself in the hands of God, at his disposition, and listening to his voice in the depths of our hearts, so that he, we learn from him what he wants us to do. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, writes James, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So what are the right motives? This is my commandment, says Jesus, that you love one another as I have loved you. When we ask, we need to remember that God wants us to love one another, put him and our neighbour first. You adulterous people, writes James. And adultery doesn't just mean sexual sin. Adultery is that double-mindedness that we've heard about earlier in James's letter. When we try to keep the world and God in tandem because they're pulling in different directions. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. I have very strong memories of when I was doing my physio training in, in London, uh, being friends with, a, or making friends with a Lancashire lass who had also come down to the deep south. Um, so that drew us together. I didn't mind that she was from Lancashire at all. Um, her name was Joan, and she'd grown up in a Methodist Sunday school, as I had, and was part of the Methodist church where she came from. And together we went to Christian Union at Guy's, and on one hard-hitting conference that we were both at, we were asked to make a choice, to choose to follow Jesus or choose the way of the world, to choose to put God first in our lives. And I remember a very tearful Joan coming to see me afterwards and saying, I can't do this, Diane. I want too much of what's going on in the world at the moment. I can't give it up to be a follower of Jesus. I was quite happy going along to church, listening to what was said, knowing in my head what God wanted me to do, but not allowing him into my heart. I think the time has come for me to make a choice, and I'm sorry, but I'm going to choose to leave the church. I have prayed a lot for Joan over the years. And I believe that God's grace will have drawn her back into his service. But I don't know. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, who longs for the spirit he's caused to dwell in us. Because we do accept his spirit into our lives, but we can block that spirit and stop it from working but he gives us more grace. His grace is there for us if we make that choice, but the choice is ours. Remembering that he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. This is a reference to the book of Proverbs, the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. 
And those of you who have followed this series will know that it isn't the first time that James refers us to the book of Proverbs. In fact, theologian Tom Wright describes the book of James as the New Testament's chief wisdom book. So in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, we read, Though he scoffs at the scoffers and scorns the scorners, yet he gives his grace, his undeserved favour, to the humble. The humble are those who give up trying to do the things in their own strength. Remembering earlier in Proverbs that lovely verse, Trust in the, heart of the Lord with all your heart, and don't lean to your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him, put him first, and he will make your path straight. Submit yourselves then to God. Make God number one in your life. Give him the helm of your ship. Let him be in control. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Get thee behind me, Satan, is something that we don't just say once, but many times in our lives. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Grieve, mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. The way isn't going to be easy. There will be times when there are more tears than laughter. But if we humble ourselves before God, he will lift us up. Mother Teresa has written in The Joy of Loving, these are a few ways that we can practice humility. To speak as little as possible about oneself, to mind one's own business, not to want to manage other people's affairs, to avoid curiosity, to accept contradictions and correction cheerfully. To pass over the mistakes of others. To accept insults and injuries. To accept being slighted or forgotten and even disliked. To be kind and gentle under provocation. Never to stand on one's dignity. To choose always the hardest. We know why Mother Teresa is a saint, don't we? But it's good advice and worth listening to. Brothers and sisters, writes James, do not slander one another. Do you remember? You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour, is the ninth commandment. We learnt about the importance of controlling the tongue last week. So I'm not going to go over that again. So anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them, speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgement on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. God is the only one who is entitled to be judgmental because he sees inside each one of us and knows what's in our hearts. None of us have got that sort of x-ray vision. But you, who are you to judge your neighbour? We live in a culture of blame and judgment. It's so difficult, isn't it, not to be swayed, not to conform to the world. The New Testament writers warn again and again about being judgmental, yet we're all tempted to do it. And sometimes, I think, sadly, in the church, the temptation becomes greater. We really do need to guard against being judgmental, both with our words and our actions. 
During my training as a physio, I was fortunate to have one of, as one of my lecturers the eminent psychiatrist Dr. David Stafford Clark. He had a reputation for writing on the starched aprons of the nurses or on our uniforms. I suppose he would be had up for sexual harassment these days, but it wasn't like that, honestly. The letters TLC at every opportunity. And he taught that nothing could be achieved in medicine unless it was accompanied by tender, loving care. And that that level of care should be in equal measure, whether the recipient was costermonger or count, his words, friend or foe. He maintained that befriending was the key to successful treatment of any condition and that listening skills were of vital importance. Now this resonated so well with my developing understanding of the Christian underpinning principle of unconditional and universal love and was a lesson I was happy to embrace in my life and to try to build into my physio practice throughout my career. It still comes as a bit of a shock to me when I hear judgmental comments. And I do try hard myself not to judge. But it isn't always easy and I know that many times I fail. We were reminded last week, weren't we, of those wise words, if you can't say something nice about somebody, don't say anything. I don't think the next hard-hitting section needs much explanation. None of us can see into the future. We've only to think of the mess we're currently in as we remember the empty promises made by those boasting about tomorrow before the Brexit referendum. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this and that. Put God first. And then we reach the final verse, the sting in the tail of John of, of James's chapter four. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. This is more ancient wisdom echoes from chapter 3 in Proverbs where we read do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act do not say to your neighbor come back later I'll give it to you tomorrow when you have it now with you I think we're all guilty of sins of omission and when we reflect on what we've done and what we've left undone each day, we need to confess those sins and strive to do better. This whole chapter is about urging the scattered Christian community back to authentic whole life discipleship of integrity, of faith and works going hand in hand together. What James is seeking to do is to call every reader back to a genuine faith, wholeheartedly lived out. Phil Goth, the minister of Leyland Methodist Church, describes it as the search and rescue mission Jesus himself calls, commissions and equips us for by his spirit. I believe that one of the important lessons of the book of James is that following his example, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to look out for one another. We all struggle with our faith at times. 
and with our understanding of the scriptures. And we need help from one another, but not the sort of judgmental help that puts us down and points out the errors of our ways. We need a safe space where we can talk about the things that trouble us without someone jumping down our throats to tell us what to do or to say. Only God can do that. As together and individually, we earnestly pray, your will be done, not mine, not anyone else's, but God's will. And we mustn't be double-minded about this. If we pray it, we should really mean it. God continues to call and commission us. And when we respond in faith, we don't know where he will lead us or what he will ask us to do. But when we invite his spirit into our lives, we're asking him to change our selfish natures and make them more like that of James's big brother, Jesus Christ, who in three short years of action achieved so much and showed us how we ought to live our lives as kingdom people.